Okay, so uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, and welcome. Uh, it's six o'clock, so we'll make a start. Uh, welcome to the final talk uh, this year of the HED 100 lecture series. Um, there will probably be some talks in uh, the coming year. Thank you very much. That's what clinical directors are for. Um, there will probably be some uh, other talks coming next year. We've yet to arrange exactly what those will look like. They won't be monthly talks, but uh, this is certainly the final one of this year, and we're delighted you've joined us for it. Uh, some quick housekeeping. Uh, if you can put your microphones on mute uh, when you join, and if you get cut off and rejoin, please mute yourselves. Uh, as always, these sessions are being recorded. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat. We should have uh, five to ten minutes at the end for discussion. Uh, and we have a number of videos that we're going to try and show. So uh, hopefully the technology gods will be with us, which is always a rather daunting thing to have to depend upon. But we'll see how we go. Um, so uh, that welcome animation that you saw was something that uh, really highlights the key themes we're going to go through. Uh, if you joined just midway through the final showing of it, don't worry. We can show it again at the end, um, and this presentation will be ultimately available online. Uh, in essence, the themes we're going to cover are uh, the issues with Chagas disease that are highlighted by the long delay between infection and uh, clinical disease, which causes all sorts of uh, difficulties with diagnosis and management, uh, the issue of vertical transmission, which will be touched upon with some cases, and pathways to diagnostic testing, because one of the main things that we do uh, try to uh, improve through the UK Chagas Hub is diagnostic testing. So an outline really of, of what, we're, what we're going to cover. Uh, my name's Dave Moore. I'm one of the infectious diseases doctors at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of background uh, information that you probably need to understand about Chagas disease. Chagas disease 101, if you like, uh, which will lead into uh, Professor Peter Chiedini talking about um, some vertical transmission that we've been involved in. And then finally, uh, Natalie Elkir, who is uh, one of our HTD Centenary Fellows, has recently started doing a PhD on Chagas disease. We'll talk about uh, some of the new uh, approaches to trying to make diagnoses more accessible and management pathways more straightforward for the Latin American migrants in the UK. Uh, and interspersed amongst all that, we've got uh, three videos, two of them from uh, two of our magnificent patients, Xavier and uh, Graciela. Xavier will describe the sort of lived experience of growing up in a hyperendemic region for Chagas disease in Bolivia. Uh, and uh, Graciela will talk a little bit about her journey, uh, slightly stuttering journey, to a diagnosis and, and how she's come to uh, come to join us. Uh, so I'm going to crack on now. Uh, starting off with what is Chagas disease. So uh, just to sort of get everybody on the same page, this is a chronic parasitic infection. The parasite is Trypanosoma cruzii, seen here in a blood film, uh, something that we would very rarely see. This is really only seen during acute infection. Uh, and the only acute infections that we would see in this sort of setting would be in the setting in the context of uh, congenital infection. Um, but that's the parasite. Uh, and on the left, you see uh, an example of one of the triatamine vectors, the kissing bug vectors, uh, that are responsible for most transmission in endemic areas. So this is, in essence, a vector-borne parasitic infection, and it has been historically known as American trypanosomiasis, although that's a, that's a phrase that has somewhat fallen from usage, but it does at least describe the uh, epidemiology of uh, vector-borne transmission, which is very much centered on the Americas. So this is Central and South America and Mexico. The current paradigm is that if you become infected with Trypanosoma cruzii, you're infected for life. Uh, that's somewhat contentious, it's not universally accepted, but that's certainly the paradigm we currently work to. And from a clinical point of view, the things that you need to understand are that there are two organ systems that are most affected, and those are the heart and the gastrointestinal tract. These are three uh, beautiful examples of the vectors that transmit this disease in endemic uh, Latin America. Uh, we've titled this slide The Silent Assassins because these bugs come out at night, as Xavier will explain in a moment, uh, and bite without you feeling the bite. Uh, you feel irritation at the bite site sometime later, but the bite itself is painless. Uh, and what they have is the potential to transmit a potentially fatal infection to you. Uh, the bite itself is not the route by which the uh, parasite is transmitted. Um, so what the what the bug does is it comes down, silently bites, takes its blood meal, and then uh, by way of uh, gratitude, then defecates at the site of feeding. And it's the uh, it's the feces that contains the parasite, and because the bite's a little bit itchy, you rub that parasite uh, in the feces into the wound, and that's the way in which the the parasite gains entry to the human host. 
It can also enter through the uh, mucous membranes, including the eye, uh, and this is most classically seen in what's known as Romania's sign. Um, this, these are two children who've uh, inoculated their eyes by rubbing uh, infected uh, vector feces into their eye after a, after a nighttime bite. Um, the paucity of uh, symptomatic acute infection is demonstrated by the fact that these are two of about a dozen photos that are available in almost all the literature of Romania's sign. This is a very unusual thing to see. And we certainly don't see acute infection in people returning from Latin America. And that's because they don't really go to most of the places where you're likely to get infected. So this would be a typical homestead uh, where the vector would, uh, would thrive. This is an adobe uh, walled building. The uh, bricks and indeed the covering of the house are made with adobe, which is a sort of mud and straw mix that makes bricks. Uh, and it's full of cracks. And if you pull off a bit of the wall, as you can see here, uh, the, uh, the vectors are, are very much at home within these walls. People who've lived in these houses and had them sprayed as part of vector control describe the almost uh, hellish nightmarish scenario of the wall suddenly becoming alive with hundreds and hundreds of these bugs fleeing the, uh, the insecticide that has been sprayed on the walls. So large numbers of, of, of these things can, can live on the walls. And I don't know whether you can see these lines of um, uh, what is actually feces on the wall. This is, this is what's colloquially known as a fecal rain. Uh, on the walls of these houses. So this is Xavier, um, fingers crossed, he's going to tell us uh, a little bit about his, his backstory. Me llamo Xavier Montaño García, somos tres hermanos, una, una hermana y dos hermanos, y nací en, en Aiquile, eh, Aiquile, Bolivia. Eh, pues me crié en el pueblito hasta mis 10, 11 años, por ahí. Me, de ahí me, me, Nos fuimos para, para otra ciudad que es Santa Cruz, una ciudad más grande. Y ahí estaba hasta mis, mis 18 años, por ahí. De ahí me, me, me vine para España, para, para España en, en 2004, por ahí. 2004 hasta el 2018 estaba en España, casi 13 años, por ahí. Ah, de las... En, En efecto de las estes, de las pinchucas, como le llamamos, es esos pues, que se crían en, una, en las casas que son hechas de barro. En, normalmente en el pueblito es donde vivía, son la mayoría casi, son hechas de adobe las casas. Son hechas de, las hacen de barro con paja y, y son casi la mayoría eran así, de, todas son de, así, de adobe. Y las pinchucas esos se crían ahí dentro de esos, de, de, de los bloques esos, de eso de los adobes y claro uno, uno cuando duerme por la noche uno se entera que si uno dice que bajan por la noche <ríe> te pican y, y no te enteras el otro día pues a veces si te despiertas a veces te hace doler y a veces puedes prender la luz y ves que están subiendo por ahí por la, por la pared todo, todo hinchado de, llenos de sangre ¿no? claro porque ya te han picado y, y no, no te has enterado tú y en, Ahí en casa de mi cuñado también, ahí que es, pertenece a Santa Cruz, una, cuando fuimos de España para allá, ya mi cuñado vi que, estaba, que se estaba incomodando, así como pesadilla le estaba dando, prendimos la luz, cuando prendimos la luz, y yo lo vi una, una vinchuca así bien gorda que estaba subiendo por la pared, que, que le había picado eso, de eso yo creo que se estaría molestando de eso, o en, verdad, en, o en realidad le estaba dando pesadillas, pero que... Casi que era normal eso que por las noches esos que baja y pican, pues al que pilla. El que... Por eso, pues, no sabemos si ahora la, la enfermedad de este Chagas que tenemos es de, de lo que nos han picado eso. O, o como nuestros padres y madre ya lo tenían, pues todo, nuestra madre que nos pasó ya en la sangre al darnos la teta, al darnos el, la... Eso... Mmm... Bueno, pues, sí, eso, por eso en pequeño más lo vi una, una parte, yo, pues de ahí a, me fui a Santa Cruz, ahí, ahí son casi, ahí la casa que hicimos fue de ladrillo, y ahí, ahí no, no, no hemos visto eso, ya no, no se crea. Son mayormente, ahí en Bolivia son los pueblitos, o sea, ahora mismo sigue habiendo los, en los pueblos, las casas son, la gente humilde, pues es todo lo que tiene, son las casas de azul o de adobe, y lo ponen, lo... Las paredes lo, lo enyesan con yeso, pero es igual, eso agujerean y eso salen, es, es igual, eso no es imposible para ellos. Y, 
Y sigue habiendo mucha... Tiene que haber en Bolivia, pues, la mayoría de los que viven en las, ahí en los, en las casas rurales, en los campos, pues, casi te hacen... Yo creo que mucha, mucha contag son contagiados con eso, sí. sí. Mm, pues, me... Mi señora, mi, unos, unos familiares me, me dijeron igual que en tal sitio, por ahí por Elephant Castle, que están haciendo una clínica. Uh, um, sí comentaron que, que están yendo, ahí van a ir muchos bolivianos, mucha gente latina que ahí están haciendo las pruebas gratis. Y, y pues dije, no, no lo pensé, dijo, pues no, yo también tengo que hacerme, no, para no, si, no, no sé si soy negativo, positivo. Y vinimos ahí unos parientes míos. Uno, estaban ahí unos, una prima, es su marido, sus hijos, a mis hijas, a mi hija también, mis dos pequeñas ahí de traje, y la, la señora, pues sí, esperamos ahí unos 20 minutos por ahí para recibir la prueba, y pues me dijeron que era positivo, y pues ahí un poco sorprendido, ¿no? Y, y a la vez digo que... Digo que si casi, si mi madre tenía algo, mi, mi madre, mi, mis hermanos, pues yo digo, es no, normal, es verdad que, claro, dije, no, tanto, no, un poco me sorprendí, pero no, si de ahí a, viendo a, como a, eran las casas ahí en los campos, pues yo digo, sí, la mayoría tiene que tener y, y así, un poco sorprendido, pero sí, lo acepté, ya, es verdad. Eh, que hagan un esfuerzo, ¿no? De hacerse todo, la mayoría, y hacerse una prueba y, y pasar el tratamiento, ¿no? Porque no, esto no es un juego, un chiste, pues eso, de, a, con las chagas, eso con la enfermedad, pues mucha gente en Bolivia, aunque tiene escasos recursos y fu, ha fallecido mucho, y hay gente humilde de los campos, y pues de repente fallecen y no, no se entera por qué ella, y, y es, la mayoría es por eso, casi, la, de, de chagas. So Xavier tells us a story which uh, which is frequent, and we have a lot of uh, patients from that part of Bolivia. Uh, there's a triangle really between cities of Santa Cruz, Cochabamba, and Sucre, uh, and these are people who have grown up in in, in settings of, of poverty, uh, and many of them will describe uh, children or young adults, usually in their 20s and 30s, often an uncle who just dropped dead playing football in the uh, in the local football pitch uh, in the village. Um, and these are presumably all people who are dying sudden cardiac deaths. Um, but it's not just a disease of the rural poor, and we've got to be careful to avoid falling into that trap. So this is another uh, another patient, uh, Adriana, 46-year-old Brazilian woman who grew up in this city in uh, south-central Brazil and had been living in the UK for 20-plus um, uh, years. And uh, in 2017, she'd been suffering with some dizziness, some headaches, some precinct, a couple episodes, which hadn't really been investigated and she hadn't really paid much attention to. But when she went back to Brazil on a holiday in July of that year, she had a dizzy spell and went to a, an emergency department where an ECG was done. And because the ECG was abnormal and she was in an area where Chagas is well known to be prevalent, she had serological testing for T. cruzi, which was positive. So she returned to the UK and, uh, in fact, when she was uh, back in the UK, she was found to have profoundly abnormal um, cardiac function with long sinus pauses, a resting bradycardia of 30, a sinus bradycardia, and bursts of non-sustained VT and ended up having a dual chamber ICD implanted in Bart. So she had quite advanced, very advanced, chagasic cardiomyopathy. Um, and she, this is, a, this is a, certainly a, a woman who would not regard herself as, as part of the rural poor of Latin America. So those are the vectoral routes of transmission, and it, when, when we talk to Adriana, it turns out that although she grew up in that city, uh, every summer she would spend the whole of the summer in her grandma's place, which was in a very rural part of the same state where she was getting exposed to the vector, so that was how she got it. Um, this is a WHO infographic, which really highlights the main route modes of transmission, so as well as the um, <clears throat> inoculation of tritamine feces after a bug bites you, um, you can also ingest the parasite uh, if your food is contaminated with either the feces of the tritamine or indeed the tritamine itself. And this comes about because people will make big vats of fruit juice, uh, particularly acai juice, in the jungle. And if a bug falls in or some bug feces happens to be contaminating the fruit, then this is a way in which you might ingest it. And this does tend to cause outbreaks in endemic settings. 
Uh, mother to child transmission will be discussed a little bit uh, in just a moment. Uh, and then the other route of transmission is through blood transfusion. Um, Peter will say a little bit about that uh, later on. But if you don't screen your bloods, particularly in high endemic areas, then that's a significant risk. Unfortunately, screening is now becoming more routine. Let me tell you about Manuela, who we met a couple of weeks ago, not her real name. Uh, she's a uh, the seventh of eight children. Uh, she grew up in Cochabamba, in this town of Cochabamba. She described her childhood as, as a very austere childhood. She wasn't allowed out into the rural surrounds of Cochabamba. She lived in a brick house. And what's curious about this uh, family tree is that her mother, anything in green is someone who's tested and has tested negative, anything in red is someone who's tested and is seropositive, and the blues are people yet to be tested. All of her siblings had previously been tested for Chagas and were negative. Her mother was negative, but she was found to be positive. She was found to be positive at one of our uh, community events, which Natalie will describe later on, which is all rather puzzling because or ordinarily you'd expect to see sometimes the older siblings uh, affected, but not the younger siblings reflecting either the impact of vector control uh, coming in to a village or indeed, as in Xavier's case, moving from a, uh, a poor uh, area with, with, with uh, adobe buildings into, a, into the city. And so when you dig a little deeper, it becomes clear that what happened to Manuela was when she was 13 years old in this city, she, under, she, she was a victim of a, a car accident and ended up having a blood transfusion. And so 25 years ago in Cochabamba, the blood wasn't adequately screened. And so she will have, she is clear, and I'm sure she's right, that she has transfusion-related uh, Chagas disease. Uh, she was screened at one of our screening events. Her uh, second daughter was also screened and was negative, and we still have in hand to, to screen the other four children because she's obviously been infected since she was a teenager, and all of these pregnancies have been at risk of vertical transmission. So what happens if you become infected? Well, I've put disease in um, uh, quotation marks there because two thirds of people who are infected and by which I mean have an antibody test that's positive for T. cruzi uh, never develop any disease at all. So in a sense, they're not really diseased. They're T. cruzi infected uh, and they have a normal life expectancy. And uh, it's very difficult to distinguish who remains in this category and who goes on to develop what's known as determinate disease, which either affects the heart or the gastrointestinal tract, or sometimes both. Almost certainly, uh, these four elements play a part in the increased risk of cardiac death in the Americas that is attributable to Chagas disease. So as well as rhythm disturbances and myocardial abnormalities, most particularly dilated cardiomyopathy, there's a tendency to aneurysm formation and subsequent thromboembolism. But the major problem is that a lot of this goes on silently until it's extremely advanced and it suddenly manifests in some catastrophic event. So this, for example, on the left hand side is the rhythm strip of someone who's obviously having very long pauses, is having uh, significant ventricular ectopics and the occasional escape rhythms, which look a little bit uh, worrying. But as you will see from the top, you don't need to be able to speak uh, Spanish or Portuguese to know that this is someone who's got no symptoms whatsoever. So if you're not doing ECGs on these people or not testing them for T. cruzii, you don't realise the extent to which their cardiac disease has advanced. The other manifestation that we mentioned is, is the gastrointestinal tract. Predominantly the esophagus and colon seem to be affected and uh, mega esophagus and mega colon are the sort of extreme manifestations of these manifest as uh, dysphagia, um, uh, or constipation, severe constipation. We have a, a relatively small number of patients who are affected in this way, probably reflecting the fact that we don't have that many patients from the southernmost tip of South America where this is a, a more common manifestation, probably related to the discrete typing unit, the, the strain, if you like, of T. cruzii, which is more common in those regions. Uh, an important thing for, um, for us to be aware of in non-endemic areas is that in the setting of HIV, reactivation of this parasite can mimic uh, a number of other things. So, for example, these ring-enhancing space-occupying lesions in the brain would undoubtedly do very nicely for toxoplasma, but these are, in fact, caused by Chagas disease. So if we don't think of screening all of our HIV patients for T. cruzii serology uh, when they first booked, then this might be overlooked. And part of the work we're doing is trying to increase the amount of testing that's going on in HIV clinics across the UK. It is part of the BEVA guideline. It's just not done very much.
Uh, the reactivation in transplant recipients has a rather different flavour to it and looks like a primary infection with a fever, rash and myocarditis. What happens when people come to the clinic? Well, uh, currently at the clinic uh, at the HTD, we have um, uh, a couple of, well, we actually probably run now about three clinics a month uh, where T. cruzii, where Chagas patients are seen um, in both my clinic, also in the clinic that's now run by Laura Nabarro, which she's taken over from Peter Chiodini. Uh, and the first thing we'll do is we'll confirm the diagnosis with confirmatory serology. You need two different serological tests for uh, the gold standard diagnosis. And in anybody who's seropositive, we'll then go on and do a T. cruzii PCR which is a test which we've really only been doing for a, for a number of years, uh, for, the, for a short, a, a few years. More importantly, I think, however, is, is assessing end organ damage and managing that. So uh, because this is a disease that can cause quite significant cardiac disease, we'll do a 12 lead ECG and echocardiogram and hold to monitoring on everybody at baseline, regardless of whether they have symptoms, regardless of whether their 12 lead ECG is normal. And that's to detect um, subtle changes, early changes, and indeed um, changes in rhythm, disturb rhythm disturbance and conduction defects that occur over time and may occur silently. We only really do gastrointestinal investigations if there's a clinical indication, uh, in other words, if the patient has severe constipation or dysphagia. And then probably the most important part of our management is treating the end organ disease as needed. Unfortunately, we have an excellent relationship with a cardiomyopathy consultant, Dr. Oliver Gutman at St. Bart's Hospital, uh, who runs a cardiomyopathy clinic and sees most of our Chagas patients. We'll then discuss antiparasitic treatment, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, and after that sort of first round of evaluation, we then carry on seeing people on an annual basis. And I should say that most of our management of HDD is informed by uh, conversations with people who've been doing this for a lot longer in much larger populations, which are our colleagues in Spain, predominantly in Barcelona. Uh, who have immense experience. So all of our patients are now followed up on an annual basis with uh, ECGs and PCR testing. Of course, this isn't just a diagnosis that's important for the patient. Uh, the patient is likely to have had, the, the patient's siblings are likely to have had very similar exposures, both to their mother, but also to the environment in which they've grown up. So we advise them to advise siblings to undergo testing. And if the patient is a woman, then uh, we counsel them about future pregnancies and talk to them about getting their existing children tested. This, for example, is the uh, tree for the Brazilian lady I mentioned. Uh, in common with many of the families we see, she's one of the older two siblings uh, and they were both infected and the younger siblings were not. She didn't get it from her mother, clearly. Her mother's not infected, but her father was infected and it's almost certainly her paternal grandmother's house who she used to go and visit. Her two children uh, need to be tested. I'm just going to finish off with a little bit about the sort of controversies in antiparasitic therapy. So there are two drugs that are effective uh, in killing trypanosoma cruzii, benzonidazole and nifertimox. Nifertimox is difficult to get hold of, so our general uh, clinical use is, is to use benzonidazole, uh, which is generally only available on a named patient order through the World Health Organization in Geneva. And the standard treatment course is for 60 days. About a third of patients don't get through 60 days of treatment. Uh, it's generally quite poorly tolerated. One of the most common side effects being this rash, which you can see on the hands of this lady here. Um, and we know that uh, amongst those who are PCR positive, the conversion rate to PCR negative is very high and the relapse rate is very low. Um, however, because of the long duration of this, of this illness, it's been very difficult to demonstrate that uh, that translates into an improvement in clinical endpoints. And you'll remember there are two different groups that we were interested in, those who have uh, indeterminate disease and those who have uh, determinate disease. It's now reasonably clear from a fairly large study that those who have determinate disease probably have less to gain from uh, antiparasitic therapy. In a sense, the, the, the trouble is already set in motion, whereas those with indeterminate disease, we still really don't know. What we do know is that this uh, treatment will prevent vertical transmission. And I'll come on to that in just a second. Uh, the other controversy really is about the duration of treatment. So 60 days of treatment uh, is what we have conventionally used, but there's reasonably good evidence that the parasitic, antiparasitic activity at least, of 14 days of treatment is probably just as effective. And we're swinging towards giving more people treatment for a shorter period of time. WHO and the Pan American Health Organization have issued some guidelines about this. Um, and this is pretty much what I've just said. For those who are immunocompetent, we generally have 
a bit more relaxed about giving treatment for indeterminate disease, but those who've already got established disease, treatment is not necessarily recommended. We are rather more liberal with those who are immunocompromised because the risk of reactivation is so significant, so most people would tend to offer treatment to people who are immunocompromised, always telling the patient that we can't tell them for sure that that's going to have an impact upon the natural history of disease. And then finally, really any uh, girls and women of childbearing age should be offered treatment regardless of whether they have determinate disease to protect any future pregnancies. And the treatment is extremely effective in infants and children and therefore all of the infants and children who are infected should be offered treatment. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Peter, are you there? Yes, thanks, Dave. Just can you confirm that I'm coming through voice wise? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. OK, well, I'm going to focus on vertical transmission and we have two cases that occurred in the Republic of Ireland that we advised on and helped with the management of. And they're in the public domain, they're published, so you'll be able to read in more detail if you wish to do so. First one was a healthy infant born 3.56 kilograms at full term and crucially to a Bolivian lady, and you'll hear more about Bolivia later. She'd arrived at Ireland when she was 31 weeks pregnant and in Bolivia, they have routine with the emphasis on routine antenatal screening for Chagas disease, and she was screened at 23 weeks. So she already knew she was positive and she told the obstetricians in Ireland. So they sent us serum and also an EDTA, which we did a PCR on in our lab at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, both positive. As per WHO policy, treatment was deferred until after delivery. Next slide, please, because there are no safety studies done on benzonidazole in pregnancy. We don't know if it's teratogenic or toxic, but there's an easy worker way around that, as you'll see in a moment. Now, crucially, again, without that history, this would never have been suspected. Newborn clinical examination entirely normal. And we said, right, we need to do cord blood microscopy and also a PCR on infant called a venous blood. So it was done on the um, cord blood and then day two on the infant's blood. PCR was inconclusive. Now, I validated a lot of PCRs and the more we looked at it, it's still inconclusive. PCR is not a magic bullet and at that time, definitely inconclusive. Impossible to say you need to treat on such a result. We ran it all again on a new sample at four weeks, still negative. Now, this is the important point because they say the incubation period about, you know, four to six weeks, three months, and we got a strongly positive PCR for T. cruzi. The child received two months of oral benzonidazole, and look at the dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram, which would flatten most of you. The babies don't actually have any problems with it. And this is the crucial thing about finding a group you can treat with high success rates. So... The child had this two month course and apart from mild self-limiting GI upset and a bit of a macular rash at the onset of treatment, tolerated it very well. Next slide, please. So please say halfway through the treatment, PCR had already gone negative, and was still negative treatment completion and at 15 months. Now, the important thing is when the baby's been delivered to treat mum, because if she's going to have any more children, you can reduce the risk literally to zero of transmission in a subsequent pregnancy if you treat her properly when she's not pregnant. She started treatment, but she stopped it after three weeks because she was worried it might interfere with breast milk production. It doesn't, and it's therefore always important to engage with the mothers and explain that to them. It doesn't interfere with their breast milk production at all. So further maternal follow-up was arranged to recommence the benzonidazole and mum was advised not to become pregnant again until she'd had full treatment and that way she could be sure that none of her children in the future would get this disease. Next slide, please. Now, case two is rather different, again from Republic of Ireland. This is a 2.4 kilogram child delivered by caesarean section at 39 weeks. The child was known to have had intrauterine growth restriction and the placenta therefore was routinely examined. They weren't suspecting Chagas, it's just routine examination of a placenta with a pregnancy that had intrauterine growth retardation. And they saw numerous T. cruzi blood stages in the membranes and umbilical cord. Next slide, please. So Dave's going to circle that cell there that's got numerous amastigotes. They're just like the amastigotes of leishmania. 
And that was a good pick by a pathologist in a country where this disease does not normally occur. And it makes you wonder how many others would have picked it up. Now, the important thing, this is the stage at which it multiplies. It multiplies in the cells, pushes out trypanosomes to be picked up by a trotomine bug. The South American trips don't divide in humans like the Africans do. It's the multiplication in the amastigote stage that gives the disease the ability to bulk up. So that was a very good pick. Next slide. So the child then was recalled, aged four weeks, and the clinical examination again was normal, apart from the growth restriction that occurred, not surprisingly, looking at that placenta. So then blood tests with T. cruzi were performed. Next slide, please. And here you have it. Now, in an indeterminate stage, we would never see this. One in decades we've seen with positive, but this is an acute stage. And the arrow there is on the thick film with a very big kinetoplast, which is the marker of T. cruzi compared to Brucei. And if you go to the other one, Dave, and point out the kinetoplast there. Oh, now bottom, you're testing me, no, Peter. That's nucleus down there, kinetoplast, <laughs> that's it. That's characteristic of cruzi and not Brucei. So that's 100% diagnostic. Next slide, please. So game, set, and match. This could only be congenital Chagas disease. We've got a full house, PCR, and seen the trypanosomes. Baby got a two-month course of oral benzonidazole and tolerated it very well. And the PCR and microscopy are negative one month at two months at treatment completion. That was an age 12 months. Next slide, please, because this is a case of missed opportunity. The infant mother was born in Bolivia, which in our practice, as you'll hear much more later, is the epicenter of where the cases are coming from. But she had lived in Brazil from the age of two. And then two years before she became pregnant, she'd migrated to Ireland. Now, the problem is 20 years earlier, she'd been diagnosed with Chagas disease serologically when she was in Brazil, when family members had also tested positive. Now, here's the missed opportunity because she'd attended an annual cardiology review, not been given treatment because her Chagas was asymptomatic. The point being that really it's not whether they've got heart disease or not. She's a lady of childbearing potential who could have avoided all this had she received treatment when she wasn't pregnant. Now, mum completed very nicely um, her two months of oral benzonidazole postnatally. And then she chose to discontinue breastfeeding because she was worried about transmitting T. cruzi to the infant. That's not a concern. It's not transmitted in breast milk. So again, it's a case of engaging with mum. Next slide and final of my set. Now, first of all, there are no specific clinical signs of congenital T. cruzi. If you look at those signs and symptoms, that could be a classical torch screen. It could be congenital toxoplasmosis, for example. Only 10 to 40 percent of newborns actually are symptomatic. So you have to seek them out. Vertical transmission rate ranges about 2 to 10 percent, but there's a series from Bolivian mothers of 13, 1, 3 percent vertical transmission, which goes to zero if they're treated pre-pregnancy. Is there antenatal screening Targeted antenatal screening of Latin American mothers in Britain at the moment? No. My concern is that since 1998, we were the first non endemic country to set up screening of the blood supply for Chagas disease. And it's been very successful, returned many donors to the donor pool. So we protect the blood supply, which me, to me gives ethical concerns because we should be getting to these pregnant mothers and making sure, or ideally pre-pregnancy, that they can't transmit. Now, there's been a very active campaign by the hub, and we're getting close now to getting it um, in place. It's happening in UCLH and other London hospitals are likely to follow, and there may, we hope in due course, be a national programme of targeted screening. So it all boils down to awareness and picking out those mothers that potentially are at risk. So I'll hand over there to Natalie. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go on and talk specifically about our non-endemic UK setting. 
Um, so we're very lucky that the ONS recently published some data from last year's census, which showed that there are 280,000 people born in the Chagas endemic countries of Central America, South America and Mexico living now in England and Wales, um, about 250,000 of whom live specifically in England, um, mostly concentrated in London. So if we zoom in into one London borough, for example, Lambeth, over 4% of the population were born in South America alone in this area. And what's the current state of play in terms of Chagas diagnoses? Well, this is a figure taken from a paper published a few years ago in which the authors looked at the actual number of uh, di diagnosed cases of Chagas, which at the time was 41, and compared that to the expected number based on uh, country of birth prevalence estimates, albeit they're quite crude, and they estimated that 97% of people with Chagas in the UK are actually undiagnosed. And we know that since this paper was published, that situation's got worse, not better, because the population has grown, and until very recently, we hadn't diagnosed many more new cases of Chagas. I'm going to pass over to the other brilliant patient that came to speak to us a couple of weeks ago called Graciela, who was recently diagnosed with Chagas through our community screening initiative, which I'll talk about in a moment. And she shares a bit of her experience about growing up in Bolivia, but specifically the difficulties that she faced accessing Chagas testing here in the UK. Mi nombre es Graciela. Yo vengo de Bolivia. Eh, nací en Santa Cruz, un pueblito llamado Valle Grande. Eh, ahí crecí con mis padres. El, el, el pueblo es sencillo, eh, la gente muy sencilla. Eh, las vinchucas es un, es un animal muy común de ver en, en Bolivia, especialmente porque las casas son hechas de adobe, o sea, de barro. Eh, no es un material eh, duro, es, eh, es blando. Entonces el, el, el bicho anida en las paredes y cuando uno duerme eh, sale y nos muerde, ¿no? Entonces tengo entendido que no todas son infec infecciosas, que algunas son eh, que tienen el parásito ¿no? del, del chaga, pero que otras no. Pero normalmente creo que es por eso, ¿no? es por la falta de, de higiene en las casas, eh, la pobreza también. La gente no tiene lo, la economía para hacer casas de material, de ladrillo, como deben ser, y entonces la gente hace de adobe. ¿no? Entonces creo que esa es la la raíz de los problemas en los pueblos pobres. En el 2002 nos mudamos a Londres por, buscando un, una mejor vida, ¿no? Y yo tuve un episodio en el, 2000, en el 2013 de, de un episodio de dos horas que me vino un, una, una como taquicardia, pero era que mi corazón latía... Eh, tres veces más de lo normal, fuerte, fuerte, que al punto que, que mi blusa se movía. ¿no? Entonces eh, me asusté, llamamos al, a la ambulancia, ellos vinieron y me dijeron que me acueste en la cama, que no me mueva porque podía darme algo. Me bajaron en camilla, me llevaron al hospital, al King College, y ahí me, el doctor me, me iba a poner los, todos los aparatos y medicación porque el corazón ya iba muy acelerado, entonces, pero de repente se, se calmó, se tranquilizó, yo estaba con un resfrío y empecé a toser muy fuerte y se calmó la, la taquicardia y de ahí, de ahí me ha vuelto a venir, pero así pequeños episodios como de segundos, a veces por la noche cuando me acuesto, yo como le digo he tenido sospechas cuando tenía las palpitaciones y por la historia familiar también de que lo tenía y... y pero he buscado aquí en el, en el GP, le he dicho a mi doctor de cabecera que tengo este problema, puede ser esto, tengo a mi papá que tiene el, el chaga y, y ellos han, han buscado en, en, en el internet, pero no están muy, muy conscientes, como que no es una enfermedad que, que todos lo conocen. Entonces, creo que hay mucha, todavía mucha, mucho que aprender de eso. Eh, solo fue un pinchazo en el dedo, no, no, no me dolió nada, entonces y salió que era eh, positiva, pero no, no me asusté porque de alguna manera lo sospechaba, entonces fue un alivio para mí poder saber que, que me puedo tratar y que no es algo que vaya a afectar a, a mi familia. ¿no? Ellos también se hicieron la prueba en el mismo sitio con la misma campaña y, y, y dieron todos negativos, o sea que no, no les, yo no les transmití la enfermedad a, los, a mis hijos, o sea que... Que fue, fue bien. 
Creo que sería bueno hacer como más campañas, eh, así como se hace para el cáncer. Ya sé que el, el chaga no es tan, el porcentaje no es tan alto como el cáncer o, o la diabetes, pero es una enfermedad también que está presente y tal vez sería bueno que hacer más campañas, ¿no? como por ejemplo la televisión o la radio o los medios como el Facebook o... ¿no? Así, así la gente puede entrar un poco más en conciencia y hacerse la, la prueba. En mi nombre es Graciela. So I think Graciela very articulately describes um, multiple missed opportunities for um, screening and earlier diagnosis. Uh, first of all, when she attended A&E with palpitations and tachycardia. Um, secondly, when she actually went to her GP to specifically request a test, but the GP didn't have the, the means or the know-how to request that test. Additionally, Graciela has also given birth to two daughters here in the UK and she wasn't offered any screening antenatally. She, she, she touches on some of the many different barriers to diagnosis experienced by the population, including low awareness of healthcare professionals um, and testing and referral pathways. And we go into a bit more detail on these in an editorial that we published last year in the BMJ. I'm now going to pass over, so that was the patient perspective to um, the primary care perspective. And this is a colleague called Carla Estrada, who works in the area of Lambeth and Southwark, which is where I zoomed in on the map, where there's quite a large Latin American population. Um, and she talks about some of the issues faced by the community in terms of access to healthcare more broadly. Hello, everyone. I'm Carla Estrada. I'm a GP currently working in Southwark. And I would like to share with you some of the challenges our patients face to access primary care. I'm a Spanish uh, GP, speaker GP, uh, which has brought me the opportunity to get closer to the Latin American community and actually has made me realize about the problems and difficulties they have to go through to conduct our GP services. As you may know, Sadak and Lambeth, they have the highest concentration uh, of um, Latin American population in the UK. So as for my experience, some of the challenges that they might face, first of all, uh, is the, um, the change of the address and the change of the phone numbers. They might arrive to the UK with a, with a temporary accommodation, and then within a year, they have to change to several uh, flats, houses, and if this uh, address is not updated on the system, ends up um, of sending, uh, and sending letters to wrong addresses. So this means that patients, they lose information about appointments, they lose information about uh, vaccination campaigns, screenings, and the same happens with the phone. So if they do change the phone, then uh, we don't have the capacity to contact them back and, 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 and we lose communication uh, with them. Another uh, problem that they also have is about the registration process to the GP. Uh, might be a bit difficult if we don't speak English, so they end up uh, asking for help in the community, which is good in case the person speaks English. Uh, but uh, sometimes, unfortunately, as I has been reported several times, they do pay someone else who help them to, um, to get through the, the registration process. And the same happens um, when they have to book an appointment with the GP. If they don't speak English, they end up paying someone else to book an appointment for them as they cannot speak a, a good English, right? Uh, it's true that as uh, GPs, we do work with uh, language interpreting services that we can use in the consultation, but actually the first step for them to, to pass is the reception. So reception is sometimes they might not have uh, enough resources in place to accommodate patient needs, and this end up in a miscommunication between the receptionist and the patient, and at the end patient leaves the surgery, without any help or any support that, uh, that they actually need it, right? So, uh, and, it, and it's quite a, a challenge, a big challenge, and, and I've been told several times that they have been struggling to, to have an appointment, they have been waiting for weeks, and they sometimes they don't know how actually they can contact us, right? Um, then as well, some of them, they might not be aware how NHS works, as they are coming from different countries. Many countries in South America, they work more like a private uh, healthcare system, where you pay for the consultant you want to see. 
but here in the UK it's actually completely different. It's true that some come from Spain, which has a, a, a similar uh, health system as the UK, but yeah, in Spain you do have the, um, your own list uh, of patients as a GP, so the patient always know whom who they have to contact to when they they have a health need. Um, definitely, we need to change the way we approach to our patients, especially those ones who, do, who cannot speak English. And we also need to understand the challenges they have. Uh, it means uh, social, uh, financial, migration issues that definitely this impacts very negatively in the health outcomes and well-being of our patients. Thank you. So there you've heard the um, patient and primary care perspective on some of the many different challenges faced by the community in terms of accessing not only T Cruzii screening, but also healthcare more broadly, including how to navigate the NHS. And we sought to understand the patient and public sort of wider um, perspective of this through quite an extensive programme of public engagement. Um, thanks to an LSHTM grant a few years ago, we held some online focus groups with community members. And we also spoke to and developed quite good working relationships with a couple of the Latin American charities that um, have a lot of experience. Um, one thing we know is that about one in five Latin American migrants in the UK aren't even registered with a GP. Um, and so the community was very keen that we come to them, that we bring screening to the community spaces that they know and trust and that they that they frequent. And so we went about to look for Chagas essentially in, in the communities. Um, through a community screening po uh, pilot. So our target population was adults who were born in or whose mothers were born in any of the 21 Chagas endemic countries. And we wanted to offer screening in the community, which meant we wanted to use a point of care test, as well as capture some basic epidemiological and demographic information through an online questionnaire. Um, we thought the best way uh, to advertise screening was through social media, as this is how the community told us they accessed a lot of information about um, health, including COVID and vaccinations. Um, and we um, asked community members to help uh, share and spread the word through different WhatsApp and Facebook channels. Um, we advertised specific screening events where people could come and see us for a point of care test, for example, in community centres in South London, where there are very large Latin American populations. And we also set up stools at other people's events, so at charity events, at mother and baby groups um, and at uh, dance events too. Um, something that's been quite successful, as you'll see in terms of recruitment, is that we have been getting a lot of three people through the door. Um, and that's because word has spread sort of specifically between the Bolivian community. Um, as you heard with Javier's story earlier, it was his wife and other relatives that sort of dragged him along to screening, having seen an advert on Facebook. And um, this is due to a, an initiative we've called Paso La Voz, or Spread the Word, um, where people are telling their friends and family to get a test. This is what the project, which is very much an ongoing project, actually looks like in practice. Um, all of our adverts go out in Spanish as language is one of the biggest barriers that the community told us about. And we're specifically advertising on Facebook and WhatsApp channels that community members have told us they use and trust. We um, co-produce all of our events with local Latin American businesses, um, musicians and artists. And this is a photograph from our first community screening event about a year ago of an Andean, uh, an Andean band. I specifically remember when we consulted some um, Bolivian collaborators, them telling us that there are three reasons why the Bolivian community kind of gather en masse in London. Um, one is politics, so if there's a Bolivian election going on. Uh, two is football, if there's a popular um, team playing. And three is, is dance. So uh, Bolivia has a very rich cultural heritage in which kind of folkloric tales are passed through generations through different indigenous dances. And we chose to um, go with this idea, dance, because we thought it was are probably uh, less likely to be divisive. I think you might get fights breaking out if you're gathering over football or politics. Um, this is a photograph of one of our point of care tests being performed. So they're um, lateral flow tests. They're very quick and easy to use. They just take about 15 minutes and are quite simple to train up healthcare professionals to use them. 
And this is a series of positive tests from our first screening event. And I'm circling this particular test because it was the first participant that we have, and it was actually Graciela. So she was queuing at the door, um, having uh, experienced the difficulties she had in accessing T Cruzy screening through her GP. She happened to just see our Facebook advert and, and came for screening at our first event, and it was strongly positive. She's since been linked into care. So who have we screened through this project? Well, so far we've screened 258 people across seven different events. Um, about two thirds of the people we've screened are women, um, almost two thirds of whom are women of reproductive age, which is a really important target group given that opportunity to interrupt vertical transmission. About two thirds are born in Bolivia, so word has certainly got out amongst this population. Um, however, we've also recruited participants from most countries of um, South America and some in Central America. Um, an important missing group is Brazilians, and it's very much our target for 2023 to engage the, Bolivian, uh, the Brazilian community. So I probably ought to learn Portuguese to help with that. So who's screened positively so far? Well, a staggering 59 people or 23% of the cohort who have come to our screening events have screened positively. Um, and so far, we've successfully followed up over 93% of them in clinic for confirmatory serology and the whole HTD approach that Dave mentioned earlier. So 49 have been confirmed with serology, which um, confers an 89% positive predictive value of our screening test. So we think it's a pretty good tool. Um, about two thirds are, are women and a similar proportion women of reproductive age. All bar one of the people who have screened positively and been linked into care are from Bolivia and one patient is from Paraguay. We've been really surprised by the high proportion of people who are also PCR positive. So, of course, this is a, a blood film. They're not um, microscopy positive, but they, they don't have the parasite in their blood, but they've got parasite DNA in their blood. Um, this has been really staggering to us because a lot of these people migrated to the UK anywhere between kind of 10 and 30 years ago, but have been walking around with parasite DNA in their blood. So what have we learned so far from our community screening initiative? Well, as I say, we've been surprised by the high seropositivity and the high proportion of people who are PCR positive. As is probably to be expected, we've seen a greater yield of positive tests when we offer Chagas at our specific UK Chagas Hub events because people are responding to an advert, they recognise their own risk, perhaps they've also previously had a test for Chagas disease and they're just looking for a link into care. So about 29% of people that come to our events have screened positively, whereas when we've gone to other businesses or mother and baby groups or, or charity events, and the prevalence has been about 5%, which we think is more representative of what the true prevalence is in the population on whole. So we think that community screening is a good way to engage the community um, and to collaborate with them and one way to potentially address some of the underdiagnosis of Chagas in our Latin American migrant community. Um, however, and the next steps in terms of my PhD are looking at screening more representative populations, for example, in primary care and antenatal care. I think it's important to mention that screening for Chagas is not without its controversies. Perhaps the biggest challenge we have is this so-called epidemiological silence. Um, by that, I mean that we know there are certain hot, hot spots of Chagas transmission, for example, the areas where Javier and Graciela come from. But aside from that, we have very patchy seroprevalence data. So we don't really know um, which parts of Latin America there is ongoing Chagas transmission or indeed in which parts there's, parts there's previously been Chagas transmission. And so our approach to, to screening is quite an epidemiologically blind one. Um, additionally, given the uncertainties surrounding treatment efficacy, um, there are some challenges about who you should be screening and how we should be offering screening. Um, it's quite straightforward when we just consider women of reproductive age because of that opportunity to interrupt vertical transmission, um, but it's slightly murkier water when we talk about other groups. Just like to um, thank some um, the members of our UK Chagas Hub, some of whom are pictured here, some of whom were too shy to send in their photographs, who have all been instrumental in delivering this screening. And I'll pass back to Dave to sum up now. Thanks, Natalie. Um, right, well, that almost brings us to the end. I guess the take home messages really are, um, there is a large and an enlarging population of people 
And as Natalie says, we really don't know which of them are at risk, but uh, can we afford to take the risk of not test offering testing to everybody? This is Chagas disease is one of WHO's neglected tropical diseases, but it, the neglect doesn't uh, isn't limited to the tropics. So we're, we're neglecting it in the UK and we're trying to address that. <clears throat> the vertical transmission risk, uh, I think Peter alluded to, is probably in the region of 5%. It's probably higher in people who are PCR positive. It's probably higher in endemic settings, but we don't actually know that for sure. Uh, and certainly we have an opportunity to do something about that. There are controversies and the uncertain effects of antiparasitic therapy is an important one, but the lack of demonstration of an effect is not quite the same as demonstrating there is no effect. And I think in general, we're rather more relaxed about giving treatment. How long we give treatment for is still uh, up for grabs. Uh, we're certainly moving more towards accepting that if people manage to get through two weeks of treatment, that'll probably do. Um, but WHO would like us for the time being to carry on giving 60 days of treatment. And Natalie's just mentioned the approaches to screening and, and how, we, how we square the fact that we might be diagnosing and treating people who actually, or, or, or testing people who don't necessarily need testing. But I think that's the risk we take. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, there's a few questions that I've seen in the chat, which I'll just quickly come to. Uh, and Peter, if you want to jump in, by all means, feel free. The first one was from Ben, which is a really nice question about whether the route of transmission determines pathology. And to an extent, the answer to that is uh, not with the exception of uh, oral transmission. So um, I mentioned that uh, you can become infected by eating contaminated food and most commonly acai juice. Actually, the rate of uh, acute Chagas uh, disease, uh, which is you know, myocarditis, can be a, a meningoencephalitis, is very high in those who acquire infection through ingestion, uh, and the mortality is extremely high. So, uh, last year, or maybe it was earlier this year, there was an outbreak in uh, a military group in Venezuela and uh, another group in Colombia um, who had taken juice in the jungle, uh, and a significant proportion, well over half of them, became severely ill and about a third of them died. So uh, yes, to that, to that extent, uh, the route of transmission does determine pathology, but whether or not you've acquired it by blood transfusion or by uh, inoculation of uh, a wound, I think is, is, it does not. Uh, Mike Brown, thank you for asking about attributable fraction of the burden of IUGR and other adverse birth outcomes. There was a clinical microbiology reviews um, article on congenital chagas this year. Those are usually extraordinarily comprehensive, and there's nothing at all in that that gives you any hint of the attributable fraction. Uh, there are case reports. There is a suggestion that if you have a higher parasitemia, in particular if you're PCR positive, that birth outcomes are worse, but there's really insufficient data. Um, and there is also a suggestion, but I think this is unsubstantiated, that pregnancy loss in the first trimester is higher in women who are infected, but it's, I think it's very difficult to, to put numbers on that. Uh, Harry, thank you. The two thirds of cases who don't develop disease, uh, people have looked for genetic risk factors and to my knowledge, nothing has been found. So we still don't really know how to differentiate those people. I guess what I might say to that is uh, amongst those two thirds of people, we don't necessarily have a very good breakdown of those who are demonstrably still infected and those who have a positive antibody test. And we're sort of living with this uh, paradigm whereby a positive antibody test means you have ongoing infection, which may or may not be true. In other words, it may be that a significant portion of those people never progress because actually they don't still have infection, but that's a bit of a controversial view. Um, Janine, are there plans to extend the project to other areas of the UK? Absolutely. Please get in touch. We're very, very keen to get outside London. Um, so uh, so please get in touch. And I, I should have mentioned that we do have a monthly uh, multidisciplinary team meeting monthly MDT for Chagas. Um, and if you have anybody you'd like to discuss, uh, then please get in touch. Uh, probably the most straightforward way is through the parasitology SPR at HTD. Peter, did you want to add anything else at the end there? Or shall we call it a day? I have one more announcement to make. Nothing to add, Dave. That's a lovely summary. Thank you. OK, great. So my final point really is uh, if and we hope it has, this has grabbed your interest in Chagas, please put this date in your diary. Well, two dates, actually. The 14th of April is World Chagas Disease Day. I mean, you probably knew that anyway. Um, but the day before, Thursday, the 13th of April next year, uh, we are holding a symposium at the London School, which will have a little bit of science, a little bit of advocacy, uh, and just a whole lot of stuff about Chagas. So if you're, if you're interested, please put that date in your diary, and uh, we'll let you know more about it in due course.
Other than that, thank you very much for joining. We'll call it a day. <laughs>